Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending another great uh, <clears throat> webinar or uh, slash seminar of BG uh, on Fridays. <clears throat> Today, we are honored to have Brian Casey, one of our, uh, our own uh, researchers at the Bureau of Economic Geology to present to us about uh, shedding a little light on unconventional reservoirs in the Western third of the Permian Basin. <clears throat> Before uh, getting into the bio, I would like to uh, highlight a reminder. Next webinar will be, the slash seminar is in January 7th by Bridget Scanlon. Uh, and uh, specifically this web seminar will be recorded and uploaded uh, on, uh, on the uh, BEG uh, webpage. And uh, now a little bit about uh, Brian Casey. Brian began uh, as a geothermal geologist with Shell in 1980 with an MSc degree in geology and uh, geochemistry from the University of California and a minor in mathematics. After Shell sold their geothermal assets, he be uh, became uh, familiar with oil field development, exploration, basin modeling, and petroleum systems. Uh, after joining uh, Occidental Petroleum in 1986 and later Elf uh, Aquitaine, he lived and traveled extensively overseas, finally settling back in the States with Oxy. He finally got to use uh, those math skills after picking up 3D reservoir modeling. <clears throat> he left Oxy for university lands in 2016 and university lands for the BEG in 2019 and has been modeling the Permian Basin on conventional reservoirs uh, over the past six years since the living Oxy. <clears throat> so uh, this uh, seminar uh, will be in 45 minutes and uh, I suggest everyone to be muted online uh, or uh, keep questions uh, here uh, for the end of the seminar and we will have 15 minutes for question and answer. Uh, without further delay, let's- uh, All right, thank, thank you very much. And uh, I guess my microphone's working fine. Okay, thank you. I think we should turn that one off. Okay, doke. Um, so uh, shedding a little light. And uh, so that means I've, I've got to find some type of uh, country uh, music song uh, in the Texas red dirt country to uh, match that. And so I, I chose Dub Miller's uh, song, Insanity in Texas, which maybe fits my life perfectly, and uh, sunlight always filters through the haze. Uh, there's been a lot of work done on the Delaware Basin over the course of time, and that's the haze. So one of the things that uh, we were really trying to do is to uh, get to some essentials that really better describe and, and better explain what's going on in the Delaware Basin. So let's, uh, so let's see if I've uh, succeeded in, in doing that. Um, this uh, type of thing doesn't happen on your own. There's a tremendous amount of contribution from other uh, researchers and scientists, engineers uh, to, to build this thing up. Um, I do the construction, uh, but I also uh, give the feedback and, and uh, uh, when things perhaps need some additional explanation or, or work, uh, it's often the person doing that modeling who sees that first and, uh, and pounds the table. So there's been a lot of that type of iterative work that uh, has taken place in, in this project. So uh, we call this the 2021 Delaware Basin Geologic Model because we released this to our sponsors uh, in, uh, I guess, September of this year. Uh, the total structural region uh, for this, uh, this model covers almost 24,000 square miles. It's really big. It's, this is a true regional model and uh, uh, that concept of petroleum systems that mentioned in the bio, uh, um, that uh, served me well in, in trying to put together some regional models of this size. Uh, it's got a 3D grid over that region that's uh, 1,500 feet by 1,500 feet with uh, 1,872 vertical layers. I think the average vertical uh, layer or uh, zone cell thickness is uh, just under five feet. But in fact, uh, some of the um, key reservoir zones like the uh, Bone Springs S3, uh, the Wolf Camp X and Y sands, uh, just among a few, uh, are actually layered twice as densely. So they're about two and a half feet thick uh, in this model. And that gives us 
972 million uh, cells. Uh, one of the objectives was to stay under a billion uh, because I discovered that uh, Petrel doesn't really like to be bigger than a, a too many um, uh, cells bigger than a billion. Uh, it slows up tremendously, at least with the hardware that we've got. Uh, it may even be a software issue. Um, there's over 9,800 correlation wells, almost 1,100 petrophysical wells, uh, seven lithophases. Um, we used a new fault model. This was provided, or the, the, ba the basic, basic model was provided by the Scissor Group here at the BEG. Uh, and uh, um, that was basement and vault faulting that we then projected up into the Wolf Camp uh, and eliminated faults that weren't really Wolf Camp faults. Uh, but then I went back and added uh, from the uh, uh, New Mexico and Texas geological surveys, additional surface faults that weren't in their uh, basement and vault faulting model. Uh, we then took the Wolf Camp and the Bone Springs formations. We mapped those to what we uh, think are something close to their depositional limits up against the, the shelf. So uh, shelfal carbonates, uh, for example, uh, hitting the edge of the basin. So you have slope deposits, basin deposits, that transition right there uh, is what we mapped to. And once we got that envelope built, uh, it was time to put together a lot of these reservoir properties, you know, such things as uh, the depth of each cell from the surface, um, the petrophysical things like lithophases, porosity, water saturation, TOC, uh, hydrocarbon properties like API gravity, uh, GOR formation volume factor, reservoir pressure. And then the calculation of volumes, bulk rock volume, pore, and hydrocarbon pore volume. Volumetric results, uh, geomechanical. Um, uh, we didn't perhaps do as many geomechanical as I uh, really wanted to, but uh, this is a pretty good selection. And then uh, some mineralogical volumes for like clay and silica, carbonate, uh, kerogen. Uh, because we were um, able to uh, build a, a pressure model for the entire region, uh, and relate uh, formation volume factors uh, and GOR uh, and um, uh, API gravity to uh, reservoir pressure. We were able to then calculate hydrocarbons for both oil and gas in place for the entire uh, stratigraphic column and the entire basin. And then uh, there was some uncertainty analysis, which I'll discuss briefly. So once that envelope is, is built, uh, for the basic uh, structure, you still have to uh, add in all the zones. And uh, one of the real problems we have uh, in uh, the Permian Basin is that a lot of the outcrops where we'd want to uh, get a really good detailed understanding of what the stratigraphy is, uh, are uh, really representing more of the shelfal facies and not the slope basin facies. So we end up having to do a correlation into the basin and uh, hopefully honoring the sequence stratigraphic uh, learnings that we have from outcrop. And the Delaware Basin is, uh, is a pretty interesting place. Uh, we probably have uh, source regions on at least three sides, the Diablo platform to the west, northwest shelf, central basin platform to the east. Uh, at the early part of the Wolf Camp deposition, uh, upper Pennsylvanian, uh, it was probably open to the south. Uh, the um, uh, potentially the uh, um, Hovey Channel coming off here to the uh, southeast and um, uh, down into the four deep uh, in front of the um, Marathon Thrust Belt here to the southeast. Uh, that change and eventually the basin is closed off by uplift along the uh, Marathon Wichita Thrust Belt. But uh, because of uh, that open basin, but three sides dumping into it, at least three sides dumping into it, uh, you're, you're pretty much surrounded by source regions. Uh, you're going to have some pretty interesting source to sink dynamics. Uh, this is the eustatic curve that was taking place during that period of time, and you can see there's a lot going on. So uh, sea level is rising and falling pretty dramatically in the Permian uh, during this period of time. And uh, because of that fault complex to the south, we have structural events which are raising things up, especially in the southeast corner of the basin. Uh, and uh, so you got a lot of dynamics you should not expect your basin boundaries, your shelf to slope basin boundary to be static. And we see that when we start doing cross-sectional studies along the edge of uh, the Permian Basin, this was actually from the Midland Basin region on the Eastern Shelf. We see that there's combinations of progradation 
and aggradation, it depends upon what that boundary is like. So it's very gentle and isn't structurally involved. It could be uh, progradational, but if it is uh, very steep and uh, the faults are active during uh, this period of time, you can have a very aggradational type of uh, relationship. So there's something to take into account. And we've hopefully done that uh, when we uh, mapped out uh, those boundaries. Uh, we didn't do as many cross-section studies as I would have preferred, but we did uh, uh, use a lot of data to try to uh, map those boundaries out. And this shows an example of what it looks like uh, when you fill it in with color and over here, just those individual boundaries for the uh, A1 through D in the wolf camp. And of course we did the bone spring as well. And once we do that, uh, we then can isopack each of those zones individually. And I discovered in the course of uh, working in the Delaware Basin that there's always enough, there are, there are always enough wells that have uncertain uh, datums that uh, when you put the, the wells into your uh, basket of tops, you're gonna get ones which don't agree with anything. And typically you'll find that they have a ground surface datum, even though the picks in that well from the logs are correct in terms of what is the top and base. So you can do an isopack, the actual sub seed depth might be off quite a bit. And that caused me enough problems when I first did this a couple of years ago, uh, so that this time around, I decided to just take a regional surface, which was the top of the wolf camp, because it's most extensively mapped of any of the surfaces out there. And then uh, isopack all the zones above it and below it and stack those on or add them to in order to get the structural surfaces for each of those individual zones. And this, I got a much more consistent uh, set of structural surfaces. Okay, so now I've got my uh, uh, envelope with the individual zones and I'm gonna have to add in uh, the fault structures. And so uh, you can see here what these look like uh, um, coming from the scissor group plus my, a few of my surface faults. This is an example of one of those big surface faults that shows up in wolf camp outcrops here near the Diablo platform. Also interesting, because uh, I haven't really shown this before, this is the traditional boundary of the basin that you'll see published. This is my structural boundary and my uh, depositional boundaries will kind of range around this. They're mostly aggradational at least the way I've mapped them in the Delaware Basin. Uh, so uh, once we get that done, uh, we can then take a look at what this basin looks like. I'm gonna take a look at it from the uh, northwest corner and uh, we're gonna fill this thing in. Uh, right now we're looking at the very bottom of the Wolf Camp Formation. You can see that uh, the deepest part is down here to the south and it probably continued deep uh, into those seaways that I showed before, but then later, got uplifted by the um, Marathon Wichita thrust region down here to the south. I've actually visited these outcrops and, and seen that combination down here. So uh, uh, the, the thickness got truncated and eroded at, at some point in time, probably during wolf camp time. But this is what it looks like today at the base of the wolf camp. And then at the top of the wolf camp, notice that this major east-west fault called the Grissom is um, very active and, and is creating a big topographic relief here in the middle of the basin. So sediments coming in from the north or from the south or from the uh, east and west uh, highlands uh, are being impacted by the topography in the bottom of the basin. This is the top of the sea. You can tell right away that the Wolf Camp Sea is the biggest interval, thickest interval, and probably was during the most active uh, period of faulting. And then the top of the B, the top of the actual wolf camp. Um, these dashed lines that we're looking at here are my um, uh, zero uh, thickness lines or depositional edges. We can see what this looks like when we get halfway up into the bone spring at the C2 interval. And then finally here at the top of the bone spring at the cutoff formation. Uh, these weird little pinnacles or pimples are caused by the fact that I did not map on purpose, uh, the shelf uh, carbonates back behind uh, the transition. So this transition shows up at really, it's got a combination of both shelf and, and slope uh, uh, faces that we're not able to be pulled apart 
in the time frame we had for this. So maybe later going in and doing some more detailed cross-sectional studies, that little artifact can be fixed, but it's, it's, it's not a very significant um, uh, feature, I believe. Okay, so now we got the basin understood from a structural standpoint uh, and a stratigraphic standpoint, it's time to start bringing in some of the other things that have been done. There was a lot of petrophysical work done uh, by uh, Ray Eastwood on this field over, uh, I think at this point in time, he's done over 1100 wells. Uh, and uh, so you can see here a typical log. Uh, this one actually goes back to 2019. Uh, so he's been working on this for quite a while. So you end up with porosity and uh, 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 mineral volumes, things like TOC, but also stress uh, and strength. So you can start to doing uh, the, uh, the rock strength estimates. In addition to that, of course, you're going to need to look at pore pressure gradients and then convert that at some point to reservoir pressures. So um, Ray is uh, uh, gathering in that information as well, and that's what the, the diagram on the far uh, right is showing as well. And at the same time that that's taking place, uh, we have our uh, stratigraphers uh, taking a look at not just the stratigraphy, but also the faces that they see in the basin. Uh, most of this work comes from uh, uh, David Carr. So we start with uh, um, the core that we have here at the Bureau. We have a lot, uh, and a lot of it's been described. Uh, so this description you see um, right here uh, comes from um, uh, Bill Ambrose. Uh, you combine all that, you look at what kind of faces you can pull out. And what I found interesting is you take almost any decent geologist who's used to looking at core and you plop him in front of these cores, and they will come out with almost the same suite of faces. I found that really interesting. That's good, actually, for the science. <laughs> so we're being consistent. But that's that, uh, what we see here are nine different types of faces that uh, uh, people have identified. And uh, we then bring that into the, um, the log curves. Uh, at some point, we're going to want to uh, extrapolate this to other wells which don't have core. Uh, we look at how that plots on a cross plot and uh, try to uh, establish unique criteria relative to um, the um, log properties uh, and the core properties to come up with uh, an interpretation of what that would look like in terms of uh, these faces, extrapolate that to uh, wells that don't have core, and then uh, we're going to be adding in anything that we have from the petrophysical work that's been done as well. Uh, and a very significant number of the wells which have had the uh, lithophases interpretation from the stratigrapher are also wells with a full petrophysical suite. And so uh, when I added that in and looked at the residual of wells that did not have petrophysical logs, the uh, amount was so minor that I could just basically uh, delete it. It was like less than 0.01% or something ridiculously small. So we did a really good job, I think, of including all the available information to try to come up with these lithophases. At the end of the day, we just kept seven, okay? Now, once I have those lithophases, I'm, I'm going to want to understand how they were deposited. Certain lithophases, such as um, um, most of the mud rocks, uh, siliceous mud rocks, calcareous mud rocks, clay-rich mud rocks, you could, you could argue these, whether they are uh, detrital predominantly detrital or uh, uh, predominantly uh, pelagic type of uh, deposits. But uh, certainly most of the carbonates we see in the core and the outcrop and the uh, siliciclastics we see in the core and outcrop, those are um, uh, detrital deposits and they have an orientation to them. We know that. So this is a way of taking uh, some geostatistical information and trying to come up with an orientation for those. So the, the, I'll go into what uh, semivariance is here in a second, but one of the tools we use is to look at the, the variation of uh, these faces uh, relative to a central point in the distribution um, and uh, measure uh, how much uh, a, a group that's a set distance from that center point varies. And we do this with an equation for semivariance. That's the, the variation method we use. And then we can, if we know what that orientation or that distance is and the direction from that center point of origin is, we can uh, project that uh, to, the, to a surface, 2D surface. 
And uh, each one of those projection, projections is essentially a pixel on this map. And so if there's uh, an empty pixel, that shows you what the shape of the pixel is. That's, that's a, uh, a region. I don't know exactly how far that is from the center of this data set, but it might be like uh, 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 20,000 uh, to 10,000 feet or something of that sort. Okay, and, uh, and then if there's uh, an orientation to low variances, that should represent, based upon the mathematical interpretation of this, uh, the maximum orientation of that detrital deposit. Uh, so that means that uh, uh, it would be the maximum length orientation, or the, basically the, um, the path that that uh, deposit is taken into the basin. Almost all of these are going to be subaqueous deposits. Uh, it could be turbidites, it could be deborites or something else similar to, to those. And uh, in this case, for the um, uh, Wolf Camp Y sand, I've got a different arrow orientation for the siltstones than I do from, say, the carbonates. And in, in both these cases, are probably uh, turbidites. And then when I uh, plot those uh, in the model, so now I've, I've, I've taken that data and I've actually run a Gaussian simulation. And uh, I, I show you what those orientations are. One of the interesting things is this is a secondary effect. It's not the primary effect. So if you look at that carefully, you'll see that there's some orientations of carbonate that are different than this big arrow. Here's another one here, okay? You could claim that those are orientations. So what's going on? Well, that's really well control that's, that's driving that. Uh, and the same applies for the uh, siltstones. This is the main orientation we see from the uh, variogram map data. But in fact, there may be uh, other trends that are popping out here um, that aren't necessarily parallel to that arrow. And that's again being driven by well data. So well data is the primary uh, feature which is driving uh, the pattern that we see. And these arrows are only a secondary uh, factor. Um, so this is what we look. This is what this looks like when we uh, look at the top of three individual zones. These are volumes, of course, uh, but we're just going to look at the top to get a feel for uh, what the types of facies are and the patterns that they have. So we see one here on the Bone Spring S3, uh, a different one on the Wolf Camp uh, Y, and then a totally different one on uh, the Wolf Camp A2. And one of the things that's really kind of interesting is the. Um, outside of the X and the Y sands, the Wolf Camp A and B are pretty much um, siliciclastic poor uh, and uh, siliceous mud rock rich. And we know that from looking at core and outcrops. And those outcrops are, are really a good reality check. Uh, uh, when you get a chance to, to go and see what those outcrops are, you should do so. Uh, um, you can look for orientation in the outcrops. You probably won't be able to see it because of the scale, uh, but you can look at facies relationships, what kind of facies sequences typically occur and uh, what kind of uh, uh, little facies descriptions would you come away from uh, the field uh, in hand? And, and, and so we've, we've essentially done that for you. And now I get to talk about that semivariance stuff so uh, semivariance is really the, the average of the squared difference between uh, the mean of a, uh, of a sample or a, a lag and uh, each observation that is less than the mean for each lag distance. So uh, the reason why we use lags instead of the individual data points is because there's so much data. Uh, it, it would uh, it'd become very difficult to make, even make the plot if we didn't use this technique of, of bunching the data uh, that are set distances from that central point of origin. Okay, so we've done that. And, uh, and uh, what we're essentially seeing is uh, uh, semivariance here uh, and that distance uh, of the lag from that center point of origin. And one of the interesting things about the semivariance plots is that uh, if your data is good, uh, you will see a very... Um, discrete pattern developing, and you can correlate on that pattern. So then two things come out of this that are really important, okay? Uh, one is uh, you can do these variograms or semivariance plots 
in the maximum orientation that you've already established, okay? The minimum orientation, which is 90 degrees to that, and the vertical orientation, all right? So you can get maximum uh, distances uh, for each of those. And those maximum distances are this range. And that's basically where uh, the lags stop showing any variance to each other. So that means that our curve will level off. That's what we call the sill. At that point of contact, that's that maximum distance. Okay, so that means that if I have done this correctly and I've got good data, I might, let's just say that this particular range is for the maximum, this might be 20,000 feet, okay? The minimum distance should be as uh, no bigger than that. It's probably less, especially for a uh, turbidity type deposit or a debrite type deposit. Uh, and um, keep in mind that I'm not describing individual deposits because of the upscaling that was necessary. Uh, on the average, it's five feet. Uh, in in uh, key reservoir zones, it's two and a half feet. And we look at the core and we see that each uh, little turbidite layer is uh, less than a centimeter thick. Yeah, so we've bunched those um, when we've upscaled to those five foot and two and a half foot thicknesses. And so we're looking at complexes. Okay, so that's, um, that's what we're describing here is a complex of subaqueous deposits. And uh, we've got the, kind of their maximum orientation uh, and, 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 uh, uh, and distance. And uh, we can now use that to draw geometry and an orientation for that particular uh, type of facies in that particular zone. However, the other really cool and necessary thing about this is that I can start predicting what the values will be away from my data control points because I've got a correlation line. And because I can predict that, I can now populate cells which don't have well data in them. They're empty cells. We, we, we're going to need to do something to project. And so this is a basically a probability function that allows me to, with a, a Gaussian style simulation to populate the empty cells in my volume. Okay, so here's an example of what happens after we have the facies done. We're going to um, uh, model the uh, porosity. Uh, uh, now, porosity is um, uh, one of those properties which we model relative to the facies. Some properties we don't do that. I'll, I'll explain that. In this particular case, uh, we first look at how the data is distributed within this facies uh, and within this zone for the property of porosity. And we see that it's kind of a skewed distribution. Uh, we can examine that for uh, max and min and mode and, and, and mean and, and maybe make some changes there if we feel that it's not being properly represented because of the upscaling that's happened uh, to get the data into the grid. And then we do our variograms. Now, this is going to give me that probability. I'm not really worried about uh, uh, geometry in this case because it's going to be within the facies, right? They're going to dominate the geometry. And then uh, I'm going to put it in the model. You can see where the well control is by the black dots. So there's a lot of empty space out here without any well control. And because I've done the probability distribution essentially through the semivariance, I'm able to predict what those values might be from a statistical standpoint. OK, so um, along comes a property which doesn't really change relative to the facies, in this case, uh, pore pressure gradient. But we have mapped out pore pressure gradient in 2D, and we re recognize that there's uh, very specific patterns to it. So the pore pressure gradient is rising as we get to the deepest part of the basin and getting uh, significantly less as we go out to the margins of the basin. And uh, we're going to capture that as a trend. Uh, here, I'm going to put it um, here in the, uh, as a secondary variable uh, uh, horizontal trend. Uh, I'm going to have to use a Gaussian. Um, methodology of simulation to use this uh, option. Uh, and I'm going to have to have done the variogram on pore pressure gradient uh, in order to use this. Uh, and I'm going to uh, make sure that the data is um, uh, correlate from the trend is correlating very tightly to my upscaled well data. So you can see here, uh, my upscaled well data correlation is 0.79. If it's uh, less than 0.7, I won't use this uh, trend methodology. I'm going to only use this where I have a really strong correlation. 
we did something very similar. Oh, let me go back here real quick. And this is the this is the end result. And you can see that the two look very similar, but there's highs where there is no high over here, probably because of the lack of uh, good well control uh, and, uh, uh, and other such variations that are brought into uh, the, the 3D modeling. Um, but the trend is still there. So another one where we use that type of trend methodology is in salinity trends. So this was really quite important to us. Uh, um, one of the other researchers here, uh, JP, uh, uh, gave us some information about how salinity varies. And uh, uh, in combination with his work and, and our work, we believe that where we see really, really low salinities is probably where we're starting to see uh, transition from smectite clays to illite clays, and it's driving the water off. So that's uh, essentially creating a freshwater uh, pillow within the formation. At the same time, uh, up here near the um, Northwest Shelf and Diablo platform, uh, where uh, the shelf uh, uh, units get quite thin, the distance between the Oshoan uh, evaporites and the Leonardian and uh, Wolf Campion um, and Lake Pennsylvanian uh, units is quite thin we start uh, to see some impact from those evaporites, I believe, that's our interpretation. And some of this may be related to faulting. So there are areas where these things tend to line up that uh, relate to faults. Here's one down here, there's a fault down here. This is a, a local potential high. Um, and then uh, we do that same trend methodology because there's a lot of rugosity to this data at this point in time. And try, that tries to smooth it out yet still honor all the data that's there. Now, we've got a lot more work to do on salinity. We don't believe that we've got it absolutely nailed, but this is a pretty good start. And it, of course, will impact our water saturation calculations. Okay, so we've got those reservoir properties done. Uh, we may have even done some of the geomechanical work, okay? But we still have to uh, uh, be concerned about reservoir pressure uh, because uh, we, although we know that there's a relationship between uh, GOR, API gravity, and um, uh, formation volume factor relative to the pressure of the formation, uh, we need to collect a lot of data, uh, mostly um, uh, um, pressure, temperature, volume, or PVT data uh, from analysis and uh, plot that up and then uh, see if we have a, a decent relationship. And one of the reasons why this is so important in the Delaware Basin is because we have a wide range of hydrocarbon types. We have GORs that range down well below 1,000, all the way up to uh, well above um, 25,000. If you look at the SPE uh, um, table for hydrocarbon types, things that are GOR of 3,000 and lower are quote unquote oil regions. Things that are greater than 3,000 are going to be gas, gas condensate regions. So we end up with five gas condensate regions and three oil regions. So it's a complicated hydrocarbon system in the Del Delaware Basin. And this type of data allows us to uh, put some uh, lines to that that are predictive. And so we take that and the reservoir pressure that we've calculated and use that to estimate our hydrocarbons in place. So now we've got all the reservoir properties that I've talked about and the hydrocarbon in place. And we wanna think about, well, how certain is our data? Um, every time I run a simulation, if I let my program, in this case, Petrel, fix the seed location, the, 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 the grid cell that it starts doing the calculations from, uh, and, and I don't ever change that seed in a, in a subsequent simulation, I'll get exactly the same map. But if I change the seed, if I let it float, every single interpretation simulation will be a little bit different. So here you see 10 simulations of porosity. I just let the seed float and you can take a look at these and you'll see that each one has slightly different patterns to it, okay? The highs tend to be in the same spot, the lows tend to be in the same spot, but they're not exactly the same. So then I can take an average of those. I can actually do a standard deviation of those as well and make those properties. Okay, now that I've got an average and a standard deviation, I can start to play with other concepts of uncertainty. Uh, I won't go into all those because of the time of this uh, presentation, but the one that we selected 
um, after looking at several different methodologies was what we call propagation error. And I think I've got a slide here that goes into a bit more detail on that. So um, in, in this case, I'm looking at three different zones and I've uh, I calculated the, the um, propagation error for STOIP. Uh, and we see that uh, the propagation error is actually quite a bit larger for the Bone Spring S3 than it is for the uh, Wolf Camp X. Uh, and the Wolf Camp A2 is actually quite large as well. Um, that means there's more uncertainty there. And um, when you look at the data, uh, you'll see that it's not based on the porosity of the water saturation. It tends to be based on the formation volume factor variation. And that, uh, even though we're not saying that this is the absolute uncertainty estimate that you would uh, have for oil in place uh, for each of these zones, the value of uncertainty is it uh, gives us another way of looking at where some of our input may be uh, a little bit um, too variable. We'd like to maybe uh, spend some time to fix that. So one of the outcomes of this uncertainty analysis was to go back and say, you know, I think we need to uh, relook at how we calculated those formation volume factors. And we, in the process, discovered that we need to uh, maybe refine our GOR data set. That's just an example of how to use uncertainty here. Uh, I might add uh, that the Bone Spring S3, just as an example, uh, has about 46 billion barrels of oil in place and uh, 213 trillion cubic feet of gas in place. And it's um, the 12th, uh, uh, there's, so there's 12, there's 11 zones which actually have larger hydrocarbon volumes than the Bone Spring S3. So it's, it's a small one relative to all the zones. This, is, uh, this, this basin is a phenomenally hydrocarbon rich basin. Of course, most of us already know that, but here's some you know, analytical proof that, uh, that we can talk about. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna roll through some pictures. Okay, I'm not gonna give you an example of every single property. I don't have time to go through 40 slides. There's about 40 different reservoir properties. I'm just gonna take an example for, for some of the ones that I think are kind of interesting. Structure maps. Uh, when we look at the structure maps for each zone, we see that on the outside rim, uh, the uh, structure doesn't really change very much. And that's because it's all basically the same. It's that top of the wolf camp datum, right? And I'm not stacking things on that shelf uh, unless it's a slope and basin uh, deposit. But in the basin itself, uh, bounded by the black lines, which represent the depositional pinch outs for each zone, you'll see very subtle changes, okay? And when you look at the isopacks for each of those zones, you'll see that they are thinning out at the edge of those depositional boundaries as you would expect them to do so. Um, this is an example of the depth uh, from the surface elevation. I'm gonna use this when I calculate reservoir pressure. So I have a pore pressure gradient, I have a depth of each cell uh, from the surface. And uh, there's a, a simple equation that you can use now uh, to calculate what the reservoir pressure would be. And uh, this is the total porosity distribution uh, for uh, these three intervals. Uh, the Bone Spring S3 on the far left, the Wolf Camp X in the middle, uh, Wolf Camp A2 on the uh, right. And all these um, next set of slides will have exactly the same zones illustrated in the same position. So this is an example of the formation volume factors for the oil regions only. Okay, this is where GOR is less than 3,000. And uh, uh, we've broken into ranges of 2,000 to 3,000, 1,000 to 2,000, and less than 1,000. So there's actually three different um, oil zones represented here. Uh, this is, this uh, set of maps represents the formation volume factor for gas. Uh, um, and keep in mind that there's five different gas regions. So there's five different formation volume factor equations that have to be run and then combined to get uh, th these final sets. And keep in mind that these are just images at the top of these zones. These are not uh, the whole 3D volume. So just keep that in mind as we go through these things. But these are effectively maps, 2D maps. Uh, Stoip, uh, in this case, uh, I've uh, uh, used the combined formation volume factor 
uh, for uh, the gas condensate zones and the oil zones, okay? And uh, when that's all combined, I can then calculate the stoip or if you wish, liquid hydrocarbon, okay? Because the condensate isn't really oil uh, per se. Uh, and uh, we convert that to standard barrels in, in, in our model. Uh, this is an example of the gas in place calculation. And this is an example of one of those um, uh, uh, rock strength properties. In this case, I'm going to use uh, Young's modulus uh, to show you that uh, uh, the uh, modulus is increasing uh, significantly around the margins, at least in the, in the case of the Bone Spring S3 and the uh, Wolf Camp A2, um, maybe to a lesser degree in the um, uh, Wolf Camp X sand. Uh, so what is a Young's modulus? It's basically resistance to being deformed uh, elastically when, once you apply stress. So the stiffer a material is, that higher uh, uh, the Young's modulus. So those higher values along the uh, flanks of the basin are basically stiffer rock, okay? Uh, and this is an example of the silica volume or uh, volume of quartz, as our petrophysicists like to say. Uh, and again, uh, the low values or the purplish values are uh, uh, for the most part around the flanks, but here in the uh, A2, you can see that it kind of uh, pops up in individual spots. That probably has a lot to do with well control and the quality of the data. So we're also gonna be influenced in our modeling, no matter how much science it goes into this by the quality of our data set. Okay, so I've gone through the bulk of the presentation. Not bad in terms of time. Uh, the, uh, um, the model has extended the Wolf Camp and Bone Spring zones to their depositional limits, so at least my interpretation of their depositional limits. Uh, we have a very large lateral grid, but it's actually a fairly tight grid, 1,500 feet by 1,500 feet by five feet. That's actually a pretty tight grid. And uh, in doing some um, sector modeling uh, from this, uh, we didn't actually have to upscale very much, uh, but we didn't have to downscale either. So it was a, kind of the right size grid. And uh, we can do a lot of the um, projections of faces with a grid of this size, and yet it still runs within, a, uh, each simulation runs within a few hours to a day. So that's, uh, we kind of hit the sweet spot for the, for the size of the grid and, the, and the, its density. It covers uh, almost 24,000 square miles uh, 972 million cells, it's big. Uh, we got about 40 reservoir properties in the Bone Spring and Wolf Camp. We've done uncertainty for gas and oil in place using multiple realizations and um, air propagation methodology. Okay, and there's some further things that can be done. There's always going to be more work for the modeler, right? We can uh, define those depositional limits through some cross-section study a bit more thoroughly than we've done so far. I've already mentioned the problem with formation volume factor uh, as a result of our uncertainty analysis. So we are looking for more PVT data and we're going to go back in and review the GOR. Uh, we already know that um, uh, salinity needs additional work. Uh, the the uh, data is, is still actually fairly rugose, uh, but we're in the process of collecting additional data. And uh, we know that there's some additional geomechanical analysis that could be done like um, um, uh, minimum horizontal stress, uh, for example. Uh, matrix permeability. Uh, almost every resident engineer who builds a model off this is going to invent his own matrix permeability if you don't give him some real data. Uh, that's just the nature of the, uh, the way the, the, the um, uh, oil and gas business works. Uh, but there is some matrix liquid permeability data out there. Uh, so the question is, can we get our hands on it? And uh, can we do anything with it? So uh, we're going to make some stabs at that. Uh, I'm not proposing that we actually do fracture modeling, uh, but if you have uh, enough of the geomechanical analysis uh, and matrix permeability, it certainly is something that can be done uh, by uh, anybody who has this model. How do we use this thing? Well, when we uh, uh, pass this up through uh, the management system, they said, oh, well, you know, you got to be careful. So we put a caveat in there. Uh, that, uh, well, you know, it's a regional, we don't recommend it, use this as a standalone basis. And that's all great. Um, how would I use it? If I was given this model and uh, I'm an oil company geologist, honestly, I would be very happy uh, because I can do a lot of things. I can test a lot of ideas. 
uh, with this model. Uh, I, they may not be right. Every model may be wrong, but this one I hope is more right than wrong and useful. And that's the key thing. So uh, we can look at it as a regional model or a, even cut sectors out of it for resource estimation, development planning. And yes, I'd want to put my own data in there as well. Uh, input for fluid uh, and uh, production simulation work, um, uh, resource and development risk assessment. I think it's, that has a lot of value to it. Input as a discrete fracture model. I think I already mentioned that. Uh, and, and in fact, um, some mo earlier modeling work I've done uh, for the university lands group, we, we did exactly that. So I know what's involved in, in building that type of discrete fracture model. Um, and uh, input for produced water management. I've used models for that as well here in the Delaware and Midland Basin, and uh, as uh, a place to put all of your interpretive work. It's, a nice, it's nice to have a filing cabinet and you can pull out and all your work is there that uh, went into this uh, project. And that's essentially what a, um, a 3D uh, model is. Uh, you know, I would convert the correlations to my own favorite interpretations for, for how the zones work. Every guy is gonna have his own way of, of looking at it guaranteed. Uh, I think we've got it uh, right, but, you know, use your own. Uh, you can compare it against um, other interpretations for the faults and the reservoir quality, the shelf margins, the facies. Um, you can export this into a 3D seismic data set, uh, and, and some of our sponsors are actually doing that uh, to help them with their seismic interpretations. Uh, so I think those are all things that uh, uh, um, I, I, as an oil field geologist, would uh, consider doing uh, over the course of uh, this project. Um, you want to get a, uh, in, in contact with me, there's a couple different emails at the bottom of this. And uh, um, I want to uh, thank everybody for letting me, uh, lending me uh, about an hour to get this whole thing done. And uh, um, we'll take any questions that uh, uh, people have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great presentation. So let's just start with question. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Um, having been at the Bureau for almost 15 years now, uh, I really enjoy seeing a broad and deep generalist showing kind of what people in the, the industry, uh, how they use stuff that we generate here at the Bureau. So, you know, you you laid it out really nicely. So thanks for that. I have a question on uh, your Young's modulus map. If yeah. You could, could you flip back? There? Yeah, yeah. I saw some patterns on there. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, actually, there yeah, there, there you go. You see those patterns in New Mexico? Yeah. On the, on the S3. I, I wonder if those, do, do, I, I don't know. I'm just speculating. You're looking at the stiffer rock up here. That's yeah, exactly. kind of reddish the, color. The, yeah, the, the stiffer rock that goes down into the basin. It looks very sinuous. Do you, do you think those are uh, uh, channel fan complexes that have maybe preferentially uh, dolomite cement? Well, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just going guessing. up here to the um, uh, faces, which are here somewhere, right there. You see these uh, uh, dark blue colors in here? Yeah. Those are uh, what we call debrites, which are very, yeah. very tight carbonates, and they yeah. tend to uh, uh, come in and, and have a very short distribution. They don't go out typically into the very center of the basin. Uh, we see them in core and they're instantly, uh, uh, everybody takes one look at it and sees the big crinoid chips and the muddy matrix and goes, ah, it's a debrite, right? It's got almost no porosity. They're gotta be very stiff rocks. So I, uh, I suspect that uh, some of that um, Young's modulus uh, and stiff, High stiffness factor uh, is, uh, is is caused by these very uh, hard carbonates that are accumulating along the margins. It may not all be just the debrites. Some of the turbinites are these things are transitional from one to the other, uh, from turbinites which are, tend to be fine grained uh, to the debrites which tend to be very coarse. But they they are are very transitional, and so we're looking at a whole complex of uh, carbonates accumulating along the flanks. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Well, th thanks. That's interesting because I've mapped, I mean, you got your tops from me on that S3 and I've noticed at the, at the, in the upper parts of the S3, there's definitely a lot more carbonate, particularly near the shelf edges, but I've not mapped in super detail um, along the top of it. And it's interesting how the model seems to have picked up I, I think some, it's picked some it subtleties out. Yeah. there. 
that, that I hadn't picked up. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? So, so there are two questions okay. in, in, the, in the chat room. Okay. Uh, Toady, if you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question, we can hear you in the room. Okay. Oh, hey, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Brian. That was a nice talk. I like seeing the, uh, you know, I appreciate the difficulty of, of upscaling to that, that, that scale. It's tough stuff. The, um, in, that, in your first slides, and I guess you can see it here as well, you were suggesting that, that it was the, um, the well placement had like a first order effect on the variograms. And I'm wondering, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, is there a way that you can use the statistics? Is there a statistical approach to, I don't know, randomize the, the well selection so you can kind of remove that first order effect and kind of dial into you know, the geology, which might be the second order effect to try to improve uh, the way you predict? Yeah, I think uh, actually, that's, that's a very good question. I'm gonna go, um, let's see, I'm going the wrong way. Go here to this diagram. You see the well control on the map on the far right for porosity. That's essentially going to be the same well control for the facies distribution. Yeah. Uh, if this was the same zone and uh, yeah, it's the same zone. Or no, this is the Bone Spring S3, but it's going to be very similar for the um, uh, Wolf Camp X sand. Yeah, so there, there is that. I, I did not do it in this case, uh, but there is a way to, uh, there's a statistical way to kind of, um, uh, uh, um, debunch the data. Okay, um, uh, so there's there there are some statistical methodologies that allow us to uh, decluster the information. And this um, te technology came out when uh, people were mapping um, uh, wells that were all drilled at the top of an anticline, but they were trying to uh, look at a bigger, broader area. And there was almost no wells in the in the flanks, but all the wells were located in the center of the anticline, so it was a biased picture, right? So uh, the, the the idea of declustering came about kind of through that. I, actually, I think it originally started in in the um, uh, gold and and uh, uh, diamond mining industry in South Africa, but it eventually migrated its way. Uh, long story short, to Stanford and ultimately to Petrel and thus into my hands. <laughs> so, so that's the story. But yeah, there's a declustering uh, methodology that I've used in the past. Um, it adds a lot of time because you have to do it very carefully. And uh, I'm, I'm not always pleased with the results, but you're absolutely right, Tody. There is a methodology to decluster this information and kind of more um, uh, thin out the biased information. Thanks. Okay, there's one more question uh, in the chat, and it's from Tong Wei Zhang. If you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, please do so. Hey, Brian, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, that's that's great talk. And Brian, can you back to your salinity train the map, that one? Which which map? Salinity. Salinity map. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Um. There we go. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So you 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 show that the salinity, you know, it's really low in in the east of Lavin County on the also the Wada County that area. It's uh, so I I saw that on the it's actually you know we just finished the oil produce oil geochemical uh, projects and we also see some oil signature is uh, is shows some. Uh, some different uh, characteristics compared to the rest of the uh, the rest of the samples in the east in the west of the Lavin country. So, in particularly, we we found that it's maybe there's some influence of the fluvial uh, delta system and uh, have some carrion type three carrion input into that direction. So it, when I saw your map, I found you the it's actually your salinity is really low. Uh, compared to rest of the places, so I'm wondering is uh, is this is the indication of the you know fluvial river transport direction and the cost the low salinity, and uh, yeah, so I try to see is that is any any you what you thought what 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 process caused the low salinity in this area? Yeah, that, that that's 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 something I had never really considered. I, uh, so thank you for that. Um, you know, this is uh, 
I was talking to Emery uh, uh, earlier before the talk, and uh, he was saying, you know, you can use your, this type of work to uh, uh, take a different look at things, and uh, and pe different people will see different things in these uh, models and maps, and that's valuable to us. So that's a good idea to chase down. I'm not sure exactly how I would chase it, other than perhaps uh, I would need to expand these um, uh, these onto the shelf and uh, and look back at the uh, region of provenance uh, to get a, a better picture of, of that uh, um, possible interpretation. Um, interestingly though, I might add that in the center of the basin down here to the south, there's a lot of um, detrital material that's coming in from uh, southern sources uh, over uh, the course of the uh, Bone Spring deposition in upper parts of the Wolf Camp. We can certainly see that ponding on the south side of the Grissom fault system, which uh, is cutting across like this. And yet we don't see those higher salinities down there. So um, it's, it, it's not necessarily an interpretation that fits every single uh, detrital complex coming into the basin, but maybe more location specific. Yes, and thank you, Brian. It's actually, you know, after I uh, ask this question to put in the chat, and then JP and send me a, send me his recent publication about the salinity uh, distribution map in the Dalava Basin, uh, the, in particular in the Wolf Camp, Wolf Camp A, and also including some brown spring uh, samples. Maybe yeah, we can. Okay. Yeah, maybe we can have a have a separate. Perhaps you number. should drop by my office and we'll take a look at all the others. Yeah, yeah, I think that will be interesting. Yeah. Okay. Hey, uh, Brian, uh, great job. This is uh, this is Emory Goodman. Hey, yeah. Uh, so most of what you're looking at here, everything you're looking at, is is data from vertical wells. As you know, we've been uh, mainly JIT and others have started to look at the three, four or five horizontal wells in the Permian Basin that actually have been logged, which is common in China, not so common here. So my question is in terms of your variogram analysis, does that, how does that inform our understanding of variability and can that sort of thing be incorporated to this analysis? Well, I, I think the um, statistical analysis, if, you, if your data density is actually fairly high in certain parts of the basin, it is, it is very high. Um, uh, um, you won't get additional um, uh, information out of the horizontal wells that you don't already have by the, by the coverage of the vertical wells. They're not taking as long a sample in a zone, but there's, it's been sampled so many times by vertical wells that you have a good data set, okay? Um, I, I think where I have found the horizontal wells really come in useful is, uh, is looking at um, uh, geomechanical properties that are not uh, in a vertical well, but they're in a lateral well. So they're looking at the lateral changes along a zone. You don't get enough of those geomechanical properties typically in uh, vertical wells um, uh, where the, uh, the data density of wells with sonic log data is much less than the overall. And, and so uh, uh, we have seen significant horizontal geomechanical property differences or um, within a particular zone geomechanical property differences in those horizontal wells that I've looked at in the past. And um, I'm, I'm thinking particularly about the southern part of the Midland Basin on the University Lands Acreage position down there, which is quite extensive. And we did look at a number of um, uh, horizontal wells back in uh, 2018. Uh, so th this is not me just guessing, I've, I've actually seen this data. Great, Th thank you so much for all questions. Uh, the time is up for the seminar. Thank you, uh, Brian, for great presentation. I appreciate it. And all questions. Thanks, guys. And the next uh, seminar uh, will be by Bridget Scanlon in January 7th. Thank you everyone for attending this and happy holidays. <laughs>